First, a few words of introduction before I begin the reading for today. The Midwife, the book on which the PBS series Call the Midwife is based, tells the stories of its authors Jennifer Worth's encounters with the residents of East London, whose babies she delivered. East London was one of the poorest sections of London, inhabited by close-knit families who spoke pure Cockney. A few months ago, I read the story of Lou and Conchita Warren when Mrs. Worth delivered their 24th baby. Yes, you heard that right. And discovered an extraordinary couple with a loving and harmonious family life. Len had come across Conchita when in southern Spain, fell in love, and brought her back to London. Part of their obvious marital bliss, Mrs. Worth concluded, was that Conchita didn't speak a word of English and Len didn't speak a word of Spanish. Today, I will be reading the unbelievable story of the birth of their 25th child when Conchita went into labor at 28 weeks. I went upstairs to Conchita. She looked ghastly, deathly white, with bright pink splodges under her eyes. She moaned. I took her temperature, which was 103 Fahrenheit. At first, I could not feel her pulse, but on careful counting, I found it to be 120 and intermittent. Her blood pressure was barely perceptible. Her breathing was shallow and rapid. Her eyes were open, but I don't think she could see anything. I said we should arrange for a hospital admission as soon as possible. I could only assess the progress of labor from the strength and frequency of contractions, which were approximately every five minutes. I listened for the fetal heart, but couldn't hear a thing. Is the baby alive then, asked Len. I didn't like to say a straight no, so I hedged my bets. It's unlikely. Remember, your wife was very, very cold today and has been unconscious. Now she has a fever. All this will affect the baby, and I cannot hear a heartbeat. All I could do was wait. The minutes between contractions ticked by slowly. They were coming every three minutes now. Her pulse was more rapid, 150 per minute, and her breathing seemed to be more shallow. Her blood pressure was imperceptible. Then, as suddenly as it had started, it was all over. She gave a terrible cry, a massive push, and water, blood, fetus, placenta, everything was delivered onto the bed sheets at once. She fell back exhausted. I could feel no pulse at all. Her breathing seemed to have stopped. But I could feel the flutter of a heartbeat, so I listened with my stethoscope. The baby was faint and irregular. It was faint and irregular, but it was there. The fetus was blue and looked quite dead. I snatched a large kidney dish from the dresser, scooped everything into it, and dumped it on the dresser. Len went out to issue some instructions and to pacify the terrified family gathered around the door. Liz and I started to clean the dirty sheets and, Linda from, and linen from under Conchita. Len soon returned with clean sheets and hot water bottles, and Liz and I started to make the inert body comfortable. Len must have gone over to the dresser. Liz and I had our backs to it, busy with Conchita. We heard a gasp. It's alive! What, I cried. It's alive, I says. The baby's alive. It's moving. I rushed over to the dresser and looked at the gory mess in the kidney dish. It moved. The blood actually moved. My heart stood still. Then I saw the tiny creature in the pool of blood, and its leg moved. Oh, dear God, I could have drowned it, I thought. I lifted the tiny body out with one hand and tilted it upside down. It seemed to weigh nothing. I have held a newborn puppy of about the same size. My head raced. It was a little boy. I felt desperately guilty. If he dies now, it will be all my fault, I thought. I had discarded this tiny living soul to drown in a dish of blood and water. I should have looked more closely, I thought. But wallowing in self-reproach gets us nowhere. 
I clamped and cut the cord. I felt the fragile rib cage. He was breathing. He was a survivor. He moved his head and arms a little, and th all three of us were stunned by the life in the baby. None of us had seen a human child quite so tiny. The baby was about one and a half pounds and looked like a tiny doll. His arms and legs were much smaller than my little finger, yet a minuscule nail completed each digit. His head was smaller than a ping pong ball and looked disproportionately large. So I held him upside down with one hand and gently rubbed his back with one finger. Just then, Conchita, who was lying quietly, spoke. Nino, mi nino, donde esta mi nino? My baby, my baby, where is my baby? We looked at each other. We had all thought she was semi-conscious or asleep, but obviously she knew what had happened and wanted to see her baby. We got to give him to her, Liz. You tell her he's very little and you. We got to be very careful with him. Liz spoke to the oldest daughter, spoke to her mother, who smiled slightly and sighed with weariness. Len took the baby from me and sat down beside his wife. He held the baby with one hand so that the child lay within her gaze. Her eyes had been evoked vacant and unfocused for several minutes, and I don't think she saw or understood at first. She had expected to take a full-term baby into her arms. Liz spoke to her again, and I heard the words. El niño es muy pequeño. The baby is very small. Conchita struggled to adjust her vision to the minute scrap held in Lund's hand. You could almost see the struggle and effort it take her. Gradually, she became aware and with a sharp intake of breath, put out a shaking hand to touch the child. She smiled and murmured, Mi niño, mi querido niño, my baby, my darling baby, and drifted off to sleep, her hand resting on Len's hand and the baby. Just then, the obstetric squad the police had called arrived. It was a thousand pities, I thought, from the point of view of the good gossips of Limehouse, that all this had been carried out in a London smog. Had it been a clear night, every move would have been witnessed and reported. A midwife, police, teams of doctors, ambulances, each with a police escort. Such a sensation would have kept the gossips in business for a year at least. As it was, not even the next door neighbor would have been able to see the two ambulances parked outside the Warren house and police coming and going through the night. The paraphernalia and personnel that emerged from the second ambulance was overwhelming. A doctor came hurrying past, carrying an incubator. Another followed with a ventilating machine. A nurse followed with a huge box. Two ambulance men and the policemen came at last, each carrying oxygen cylinders. All this equipment had to be maneuvered past the three coach prams and two ladders lining the hallway. The washing hanging overhead didn't help because it got caught up on the equipment and several small dainty items personal to the young ladies of the house were transported upstairs. The children who had been in and out of the bed all night hung over the banisters and hidden doorways to get the full impact of the procession. On reaching the bedroom, the medical staff entered whilst the policemen and the ambulance men were directed down to the kitchen to join their colleagues for tea. Nevertheless, the bedroom of average size now contained five doctors, two nurses, a midwife, and Len and Liz. There was equipment everywhere. My delivery instrument still covered the dresser. The obstetrician's was on a chest of drawers. The pediatrician's had to be left on the floor while we hastily cleared space. I think we'll push off now, said the registrar to his colleague. The I'm very glad to see you. The mother is to be nursed at home. Good luck with the baby. <clears throat> they left, but the general practitioner remained. The pediatrician looked at the baby and gasped. Think he'll make it, sir, asked the young doctor. We'll have a damn good try, said the pediatri pediatric registrar. Fix up the oxygen and the suction and heat up the incubator. The team got busy. The pediatrician leaned over Conchita to take the baby. 
You could not tell whether she was asleep or semi-conscious, but the muscles of her arm tightened and she held the baby fast. He said to Lynn, would you tell her to let me have the baby, please? I've got to examine him before we can transport him. Len leaned over his wife and murmured to her, trying to loosen her hand. It tightened, and her other hand came up to cover the first. Liz, love, you tell your mom we got to have the baby to take to hospital. He shook her gently, trying to waken her. Her eyes flickered and opened a little. Liz bent over and spoke to her in Spanish. None of us could tell what she said. Conchita opened her eyes more and tried to focus on a little creature lying on her chest. No, she said. Liz spoke to her mother more persuasively and urgently this time. No, said her mother. Liz tried a third time. Morira, Morira, he will die. The effect on Conchita was dramatic and immediate. She opened her eyes wide, desperately trying to focus on the people around her. She saw the equipment and the white coats. I think her clouded brain took it all in and she struggled to sit up. Liz and Len helped her. She looked wildly around at everyone, thrust the baby down between her breasts and folded her arms over him. No, she repeated, then repeated louder. No, mama, you must, said Lynn soft, Liz softly. If you don't, he will die. Conchita's face was blank with anguish but something was going on in her mind. One could almost see her struggling to get her thoughts under her command. Struggling to think, to remember, she held her breast and the tiny baby fast and glanced down at his head. The sight of it must have been the catalyst that brought it all together for her. Her mind seemed to clear and a fierce, determined look came into her huge black eyes. She looked around at each of the people in the room. Her eyes, finally clear and focused, and said with perfect confidence, no, sequere comigo, he stays with me. No, Morira. Then with more emphasis, no, Morira, he will not die. The doctors didn't know what to do. Short of tearing her arms apart with brute force, which Len would not have allowed, and grabbing the baby, there was nothing they could do. The pediatrician said to Liz, tell her that she can't look after it. She hasn't got the equipment or the know-how. Tell her the baby will be taken to the finest children's hospital in the world and will have expert treatment. Tell her he cannot live without an incubator. Liz started to speak, but Len stepped in and showed his true strength. He turned to the doctors and nursed. This is all my fault, I must apologize. I said the baby could go to hospital without consulting my wife. I shouldn't have done that. When it comes to the kitties, she must always have the last word she must, and she don't agree to it. You can see she don't, and so the baby's not going nowhere. He'll stop here with us, and he'll be christened, and if he dies, he'll have a Christian burial. But he's not going nowhere without his mother's consent. He looked at his wife, and she smiled and stroked the baby's head. She seemed to understand that he was on her side, and the battle was over. She looked at him with confident love and said quietly, No more, Rira. There you are, said Lynn buoyantly. He won't die. If my Connie says that he won't die, then he won't. You can take it from me. And that was that. The doctors knew they were defeated and started to pack up their equipment. Len graciously apologized a second time, thanked them for the trouble they had taken, and said again that it was all his fault. He offered to pay for the expense of the ambulance and the time of the medical and nursing staff. He offered them a cup of tea in the kitchen. They declined. He gave them one of his winning smiles and said, go on, have a cup. You got a long journey and it'll warm you. He had such an engaging way about him that everyone agreed to accept the hospitality, even though they were all cross about the wasted journey. He and Liz helped the team downstairs with all their equipment, and the GP and I were left alone. He had hardly spoken during the past three hours or so, and I liked him for this. We knew that we had a huge responsibility, and that both mother and baby could still die. 
Conchita's condition had been serious, but now with the loss of two pints of blood, it was critical. She must have blood, said the GP. I've taken a sample for cross-matching, and as soon as a blood bank can supply it, I will set up an IV. We will need a district nurse to stay with her while it is going in. Can you sisters provide one? I told him I was sure of it. He said, I'm going to start antibiotics at once because she's breathing only into the upper lobes. I would like to listen to her chest, but I doubt if she would let me because of the baby. And he was right. She wouldn't. Now I'm going to try and see about this blood. That's as much as I can do at present. Frankly, nurse, I don't know what to do about the baby. I think I will leave it to you and the sisters. They are sure to have more experience than I. Or me, I said. I've never handled a premature baby before. We looked at each other with shared helplessness, and he left. Bless him, I thought. He hadn't had any sleep for God knows how long. It was 5 a.m., it was a filthy morning, and now he was leaving on foot in thick fog to try to get the blood sorted out. No doubt he had a surgery at 9 a.m. and a full day's work after that. I was so tired I could scarcely think. The adrenaline had been pumping all night and now my body was drained. Conchita was sleeping. The baby could have been alive or dead for all I knew. I tried to think if there was anything I could do, but my brain wouldn't work. Should I go back to Nanada's house? How could I get there? The policeman had gone, and I couldn't face the prospect of cycling alone in the fog. Just then, Liz came in with a cup of tea. Sit yourself down, lovey, and have a rest, she said. I sat down in the armchair. I remembered drinking half a cup of tea, and then the next moment, it was daylight. Len was in the room, sitting on the bed, brushing Conchita's hair and murmuring sweet nothings to her. She was smiling at him and the baby. He saw me waken and said, feel better now, nurse? It's 10 o'clock, and it said on the news that the fog will start to lift today. I looked at Conchita, who was sitting up in bed, the baby still between her breasts. She was stroking his little head and cooing to him. She looked pathetically weak, but her skin color and her breathing had improved. Above all, her eyes were still focusing and she looked collected. The delirium from concussion had quite gone. From then on, she improved rapidly. No doubt the blood and penicillin helped, but alone it could not have affected the astonishing transformation within a few hours from someone close to death who didn't even know her own husband to a calm, competent woman who knew exactly what she was doing and why. I have a theory that it was the living baby that cured her and that the crisis had occurred when she thought that they were going to take him away. In that moment, her powerful maternal instincts had kicked in and told her that she was the protector, the provider. She didn't have time to be ill. She couldn't afford to be woolly-minded. His life depended on her. Had the baby died at birth, or had he been taken away to hospital, I think Conchita would have died also. The animal world is full of such stories. I have heard that a sheep or an elephant will die if the baby dies and live if the baby lives. The level of consciousness or unconsciousness is also deeply interesting. Having sat with many dying patients over the years, I am not at all convinced that what we call unconscious is anything like the state of unknowingness we think it to be. Conchita had seemed quite unconscious, yet her hand tightened over her baby when the pediatrician tried to take him. She could not have seen who was in the room because her eyes were not focusing, nor known what had been said because she did not understand the language. Yet somehow she understood that they were planning to take her body away, her baby away, and she fought back with every ounce of her strength. This had cured her. Conchita reached for a saucer at the side of her and began to squeeze her nipples, pressing out, of, pressing out a few drops of colostrum which fell into the saucer. Then she took a fine glass rod which was used by one of her daughters for icing cakes. She held the little baby in her left hand and having suspended a drop of colostrum on the glass rod, touched his lips with it. 
I watched, fascinated. His, his lips were no bigger than a couple of daisy petals. A tiny tongue came out and licked the fluid. She repeated this about six or eight times and then tucked him back between her breasts. Len said, she'd been doing this every half hour since six o'clock, though they both have a little sleep and she does it again. She said he won't die and he won't, you know. She knows how to look after him. I checked that she was not bleeding unduly and left. I had to get back to Tornado's, to Nanada's house to report and to request a district nurse to monitor the blood transfusion when it arrived. The smog was beginning to lift and one could just about see across the road. It felt as though the world was filling with new life as the foul smog cleared and I cycled back with a light heart. Sister Julianne herself prepared a huge breakfast of double bacon and eggs for me to keep the wolf on the door, as she put it, and then took my report in the, report in the dining room whilst I was eating. She said, I have never cared for such a premature baby by myself, but a sister in one of our other houses has experience. We will consult her. Conchita will have to be watched very carefully for further blood loss. She found the whole story astonishing and said quietly, God's will be done. She then went to make arrangements for covering the blood transfusion. Conchita did not lose any more blood. After the transfusion, color returned to her cheeks and also to lens. She was weak, but all danger had passed. The baby lay on her breast day and night, fed in the manner that I have described about every half hour. All the lay staff and sisters from the Nada house came to see the two of them. It was such a beautiful and unusual sight. On the fourth day, I weighed the baby in a handkerchief. He was one pound, 10 ounces. After three weeks, Conchita began to get up for short periods. I had thought ahead and had wondered what would happen to the baby. Obviously, Conchita had also been thinking ahead and knew exactly what to be done. She had asked Liz to acquire from the dressmakers several lengths of the finest unbleached silk. With the help of her skilled eldest daughter, she fixed a kind of sling or firm blouse around her shoulders and breasts, tight underneath but loose above. The baby was carried in this for five months between his mother's breasts, never leaving her. Who had taught her this? I have never before or since in any literature heard of such a way of caring for a premature baby. Was it purely maternal instinct? I remembered back to the delivery and in her, to her monumental struggle when they tried to take the baby. I had the impression then that she was trying to think, trying to remember something, and the sudden clarity and conviction with which she said, no more era. Then, had she, had she remembered then seeing a peasant or gypsy woman carrying a tiny premature baby like this when she was a child in southern Spain? Had this fleeting memory of times half forgotten been the cause of her conviction that her baby would not die? Some years later, when I was a night sister at the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital in Houston, I cared for several premature babies of about the same gestation and weight. They were all nursed in incubators, and I do not remember any fatalities. The hospital staff prided themselves on the excellent modern care which preserved the life of the baby. The hospital way and Conchita's way were poles apart. Incubators are babies are alone all day and all night, lying flat on a firm surface, usually in strong light. Only hands and clinical equipment touch the baby. Food usually comes as formula cow's milk. Conchita's baby was never alone. He had the warmth, the touch, the softness, the smell, the moisture of his mother. He heard her heartbeat and her voice. He had her milk. Above all, he had her love. Possibly today, her decision to refuse hospitalization for the baby would have been overruled by court order. The assumption being that only trained staff and advanced technology can adequately care for a premature child. In the 1950s, we were less intrusive into family life and parental responsibility was respected. I am forced to the conclusion that modern medicine does not know it all. 
Admittedly, Conchita was lucky. The speed of delivery might have caused brain damage to the baby, but this did not occur. Apart from that, the great danger for a premature baby arises from immature vital organs, especially lungs and liver. The baby did indeed become very jaundiced more than once in the first few months, but each time it passed. It was a miracle. After I had heedlessly left the baby in a kin kidney dish, that his lungs were not wholly or even partly collapsed from the birth. I can take no credit for that. However, the fact is, he breathed. I like to think that by holding up upside down and tapping his fragile back with a finger, I facilitated his first breath. His mother was advised to do the same after each feed. Because a fluid enters the trachea, a premature baby cannot cough as a full-term baby would. She was also given a, given a very fine suction tube and shown how to use it. Apart from that, which was very little, the baby received no medical treatment. The constant temperature of his mother's skin, um, I am sure, uh, and kept his body temperature stable. Possibly the constant rise and fall of her breathing helped him over the first critical weeks. I am sure that her feeding policy, a few drops of breast milk placed on the lips at frequent intervals, was the right one. She even did this all through the night, I was told. Conchita took no precautions about sterilizing her feeding equipment. I doubt if she'd ever heard of such a thing. The saucer and the glass rod were simply wiped clean after each use, ready for the next time. The baby survived. Either he is the ultimate survivor, or we put too much emphasis on technology and techniques, I thought. We visited three times a day, every day for six weeks, then twice a day for a further six weeks. Thomas home care was good in those days. At four months, he weighed six and a half pounds and was responding with smiles and turning his head. He reached out a tiny hand to grasp a finger. He gurgled and chuckled to himself. I was told he hardly ever cried. Several times in those past postnatal months, I thought of that dreadful night when he was born and remember Sister Julianne's word to me as I left. God be with you, my dear. I will pray for Conchita Warren and her unborn baby. She had not just said that she would pray for Conchita, nor had she assumed that the fetus would be born dead. She had said with equal emphasis that she would pray for them both. In fact, she prayed for us all. One happy day in midsummer, I made a routine call to check the weight of the baby. Laughter was coming from the downstairs kitchen as I descended the stairs. The baby was lying in a cot with his brothers and sisters around him. They were all laughing. A delicious smell wafted towards me. Conchita, smiling and in full command, was standing over the steaming copper boiler making plum jam. The copper boiled furiously as she stirred with a huge wooden spoon. Thank God she had had the wisdom and the strength not to let the baby go, I thought. Had she done so, I felt sure that she would have died and all the happiness of the household would have died with her. Thank you.